Hello, and welcome to the special UDL in 15 Minutes, where educators discuss their experiences with UDL. I'm Louie Lord Nelson, UDL author and leader. Today's episode is being recorded in front of a live studio audience at the UDL IRN Summit in Orlando, Florida. <laughs> I'm talking with Camille Wheeler, who's a learning coach at Sunflower Elementary in Lawrence, Kansas. Today, Camille is going to share how she and fourth grade teachers in her school adopted Show What You Know to find out what their students really know. Hi, Camille. How are you? I'm great. Overwhelmed and extremely nervous. (laughs) I understand. I know. Well, thank you so much for coming on to this network, Learn and Live, Learn Live, and uh, here at First Live UDL in 15 minutes. Really appreciate it. So uh, Camille and I found out something immediately, that we have something in common, other than both loving UDL, that we both moved to Lawrence, Kansas about the same time. Mm-hmm. And I was there for three years. She still lives there. Mm-hmm. And she taught the daughter of one of my best friends, who still lives in Lawrence, Kansas. So it's a really, really small world. As a friend of mine said, it's uncomfortably small if you're nefarious. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so... Okay, on the way back to UDL, would you describe Sunflower Elementary to the audience, and what is the profile of the students that you serve? Okay, we're a K-5 elementary school. We have roughly 460 students, maybe 40% free and reduced, roughly 80% white, 20% other. We probably have three sections, roughly three or four sections in each grade level. And... You're a learning coach Mm -hmm. at Sunflower. Could you share what that job entails and how you weave in your passion for UDL? Absolutely. And I do have a passion for UDL. If I get tears, it's because I'm not kidding, I do. But it took me a while. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we would hear about it and read about it. And it just, what clicked for me is when someone said, well, we're not changing the students, we're changing the environment. And I was like, oh my gosh, I knew that. But when someone told me that, it clicked. So I could take that along with the UDL guidelines, which I take with me everywhere, and help the teachers understand there's research behind it, which we need to know, but we really want to know how to put it to practical and usable use in the classroom. So that's what I try to do, take the guidelines, help them identify variables, and then what can we do to enhance the lessons. You know, I think what you just brought up, that what triggered for you was that not changing the child, changing the environment. We all have our different ways of coming into the framework. And I addressed this a little bit this morning, but I think that's part of the complexity of sharing it with others because it's finding that right message, which is why I love doing the podcast, because different people, of course, share that message. But I'm always fascinated to hear what was the, what, what was the trigger for people and how they came into that. So it's lovely to hear that yours was yes, changing the environment. It was. And you know, it's something I think as educators we know. We're right. not going to change a yeah. student. But we have so many options to change the environment to benefit who they are. Right. And I think the other part of that message that you took in very quickly was that it's the barrier is within the environment. The barrier is not within the learner. Right. And that's a little harder for people because once they start to dig into that aspect, it's like, whoa, what are you talking about? Because that kid brings this in with them. And you're like, yeah, you know what? We bring in who we are as a person, but context, baby, right? <laughs> and we've had great conversations over the word bar- barrier yeah. or variable because people have their own perception of what that means. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's been great. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Okay, so now it's time for your story. Okay. People are going to love hearing what you have to say about those fourth grade teachers and what they put together. So go ahead. All right. And now, before I say that, I will say we have lots of grade levels that do great things at Sunflower. Oh, yes. Fourth we'll grade is what we, Yes. And fourth grade is, is what we chose to talk about it. But I had a couple teachers come to me and say, okay, we are teaching the standards in ELA. We have a resource that we use district-wide. Mm-hmm. We have a weekly assessment that we give to check for student understanding. But we don't feel like we're getting the information from the students that they know. We know they know main idea, but we're not allowing them to give us all their information. I mean, how awesome is that? Yes. That thought, right? So I pulled the guidelines out, and I'm like, hmm, let's see. Well, that falls under 
action and expression. Mm-hmm. That so that mm-hmm. okay, so they identified their variable on their own. This they knew this was the variable that was holding them back. So then we thought, okay, so we teach the standard, we use the resource. How can we change the assessment? So they designed a very we, we had an original name for it, a show what you know, mm-hmm. because that's what they're doing. They're showing what they know. <laughs> yes. And so they provided options. Every week, the, the, the kids get a, a planning page, well, a brainstorming page first, a planning page, and then they choose to show how they, uh, what they know about the information. Okay. The planning page and the brainstorming page stays the same every week. Now, just in the session before this, a, a lady came up and we were talking about it. And she said, well, why don't you have an audio version of mm. the planning stage in the brain, the brainstorming, right? It's a continuous learning process. I was right. like, oh my gosh, that's such a good idea because right now it's all on paper. Right. So when they first started it, they were very structured. And then as they went along, they released that control to the students. And that is amazing when you see fourth graders Their learning main idea, they're getting that direct instruction, but then they take it upon themselves to plan out how they're going to show it. They brainstorm all the different ideas, then they plan it out. And we've had iMovies. A lot of kids choose paper pencil, which Mm -hmm. I think is very interesting. We have, um, we use a platform called Seesaw, so we have some students that present theirs uh, uh, through audio Mm -hmm. because that's how they're most comfortable. The teachers are assessing the same information, they're just getting it a different way. Right. So what came to mind was that as you were saying that the teachers were releasing that to the students slowly, to me, it was this perfect example of scaffolded learning, but not just for the students, but also for the teachers, because they were learning to probably let go and move and shift from being the teacher to the facilitator. And so they were taking on something new, but they didn't like jump into the 12 foot deep end of the pool. They all just kind of waded in together. Yes, and, th- and that's a great point because when we bring up UDL, it can be so overwhelming. Like, oh my gosh, where do we start? Right. So at the very beginning, even with the fourth grade teachers, we went through and we validated what they were already doing. Mm-hmm. So there, you know, the instruction with the, e- uh, the ELA was wonderful. It was just the assessment part that, that they were having problems with. And we just ha- I remember saying, we just have to try it. Right. Honestly, are we going to get worse information than we've that we're getting now, right? right? What we're getting now isn't as effective as it could be. So we just tried it. And I think the other great thing about the example is, like you said, you all did a deep dive into action and expression, looking mm-hmm. for different ways they could show what they know. But inherently, it draws in other parts of the framework. And so we speak about intentionality. We need to have intentionality in our use of the framework but even with intentionality, we still bump up against, right? So I'm thinking about all the engagement is there because I'm assuming that there are learners who were either not previously successful on assessments or maybe they didn't finish projects. They didn't finish this kind of long-term work before, yet in this process, now they do. So you've mm-hmm. kept them engaged all the way through. Yes, and we were just talking about that. One of our ESC administrators was over at the office talking to the principal, and a a fourth grade teacher came in with work from students who they've had behavior issues, don't really get into ELA, whatever, and they did it, and they produced something awesome. They knew main idea and details, and you could tell by the product that they, they produced. It wasn't question answer. It was a product they created, and the teacher was so excited so yeah. and to see her smile yeah. you know it w- it was great yeah. yeah and i think that's the other benefit to when you have a concentrated look at the framework you have somebody with you who's acting as a learning coach i mean your your role is so valuable and i know there are teachers literally around the world that wish they had a coach in their environment that helped them along in not only using the UDL framework, but also the expertise that you share. So could you talk a little bit about where your role sat with the creation of this idea? Well, first of all, I I felt like I gave them permission to do it. And I I didn't, but I felt like they just needed someone to say, sure, we can try it. We're doing what we need to do. We're just asking for it in a different way. And then we sat and planned they implemented it. Sometimes I would go in with the, the guidelines and observe a lesson, 
you know, I would show them what I saw and then we would meet probably once every two weeks and we would talk about if they were getting what they needed and if not, what could we do to change? And it's a constant. Mm -hmm. I mean, it will never, never end. So in your coaching role, do you tend to take strategies and methods with you? Is it an interchange of ideas? Is it you're going and listening? I'm sure it varies, but can you kind of talk about that? Yeah, it it does vary. I would say with UDL, once it clicked for me, Mm -hmm. I could take it to them and say, okay, this is what the UDL framework is. Mm -hmm. This is what I think we can do. So I was more direct with this approach just because it was so new. Yeah. And then once I felt like, okay, we, we're going, we, we have some buy-in, then I'm more of a listener and a guider. And Right. Um, so when you're sharing your ideas, do you do like, well, I, well, let me tell you what this idea is, but this is where it came from. It's mm-hmm. because it came from, oh, okay. I do, yes. Awesome. And um, our principal's buying us books. We've had person-to-person PDs, we've right. had podcasts that we listen to, okay. yeah, and we do a lot of Great. discussion, and we do a lot of teacher shares. It's so organic because the fourth grade teachers will share their successes and their mistakes, and then other teachers are like, ah, oh, yeah. we're hearing it from a teacher, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. someone who does it. Okay. So with those teacher shares, could you describe what those look like? Are they always within grade-specific teams? Do you do school-wide sharing? We've done a little bit of both. Okay. Um, we, and I think the most productive was the school-wide sharing. And I just think I could stand up and talk to them about it. You know, our principal could stand up and talk to them about it. And then the people in the back are like, yeah, well, right. are you in a class with 30 kids? Right? And that's fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when the teachers stand up, they stood up together They explain their show what you know and why they did it and where it came from on the guidelines, right? They were looking at action and expression so that they could refer back to the guidelines. Right. And and they shared. And we had a first grade teacher that took what fourth grade teachers were doing and implemented it with first graders. Oh. See how awesome is that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. And it's so hard to share those, but that's when I'm like, ah, oh, if they wrote up the lesson plans and there was a video recording of it and just the compare contrast part about that. That'd be beautiful. Well, and we have then had cross grade level shares where the first grade teacher has come to fourth grade and said, okay, this is what I did. And then they communicate and say, oh, you know, try this, try that, or I've changed that. And I'm there, but a lot of times if they're talking and leading the discussion, I think that's more powerful than if I come in and yeah. And tell them what to do or try to tell them what to do. I understand. I think Camille has done a fantastic <laughs> job here at live up on the stage. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you for having me because I love to share the process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I do. Thank I you love so to share our journey. Right. Well, you've done a great job. Thank you. All right. So uh, for those listening to this podcast, you can find supplemental materials like an image montage with closed captioning, that montage with audio descriptions, a transcript, and an associated blog at my website, theudlapproach.com forward slash media. And finally, if you have a story to share about UDL implementation in 15 minutes, you can contact me through theudlapproach.com. And thanks to everyone for your work in revolutionizing education through UDL and making it our goal to develop expert learners. 